by grace alone somehow I stand Where even angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close With nail-scarred hands into his everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear Great I am, the Lord is here Oh, praise the one who fights for me And shields my soul eternally
Good morning, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to worship. It's great to have you with us once again, whether you're joining us on uh, Facebook or YouTube. Uh, just to keep you updated, that uh, many of you will be aware that uh, as of Saturday, the 4th of July, that we can now start to open up our church buildings once again. And you should be aware that the church leadership teams in all our churches have begun the great task of working their way through to understand uh, the l rules and regulations and all the guidance. And currently they're working through all the different checklists and risk assessment forms to uh, ensure that when we do come to open up our buildings again, that they are the safest that they can be, both for us as church families uh, and all of those that will be coming into our building from the community. So please bear with us uh, in the next few weeks or so as we work through all of those and to, uh, to come to some firm plans and timescales. And I'm sure that uh, you'll be praying for the leadership teams as they uh, do all of that really, really important work. But it won't be too much longer before we're able to, to be back together and to begin that journey of uh, getting back to some normality of pattern of meeting and worshipping and praying and being together. But now let's come to our worship and let me offer you uh, a call to worship just to help us bring us to that sense and that reality of the God who we're here to worship. So come to worship. Come and give God all that you are. Put your hearts into it and make up your minds now to give him the best. With all our hearts that we come to worship. Open up your souls and your spirits. Let his spirit move and touch you with all our souls that we come now to worship. So don't switch off your brains, but worship now thoughtfully and intelligently. And with all our minds, we come to worship. So put your back into it. Never tire of exalting God and showing others that you really mean it. And with all your strength, we now come to worship. All creation worships God. Everything that we are now comes to give him the best. So let's worship as we sing or as worship as we listen with our first worship song. <laughs> i 
So let's pray. You are holy. You are holy, Lord, the only God, and your deeds are wonderful. You're strong. You are great. You are the most high. You are almighty. You, Holy Father, are king of heaven and earth. You are three and one, Lord God, all good. You're good, all good, supreme good, Lord God, living and true. You are love, you are wisdom, you are humility, you are endurance, you are rest, you are peace, you are joy and gladness, you are justice and moderation, you are all riches and you suffice for us, you are beauty, you are gentleness, you are our protector, you are our guardian and defender, you are our courage you are our haven and our hope. You are our faith, our great consolation. You are our eternal life, great and wonderful Lord, God Almighty, our merciful Saviour, our God and our all. We adore and we worship you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let our 
to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak
So let's pray. Lord, our world needs changed lives, healed bodies, people freed from greed and compromise, people living for your kingdom, not just for themselves. So, Father, send us out with your gospel. Lord, our world needs freedom. And we pray that people will be healed, that they will be set free, that people will be alive because of you. So, Father, send us out with your power. Lord, our world desperately needs a king. And we pray that people will come to recognise Jesus as son of the living God. And people that will give their all to follow him. Father, send us out with your calling. And Lord, our world needs love. We pray for those in need of grace and mercy. We pray that people will be sold out for you and committed to each other. Father, send us out with your compassion. And Lord, our world so desperately needs feeding. We pray for those who need feeding with love and compassion. For those who need to be nourished with food and water. For the people to be fed by word and spirit, by bread and wine. Father, send us out with your invitation. Lord, our world needs disciples. Send us out and remain with us until the end of the age. Amen.
You know, if you ever could do it, one of the best ways to discover a Christian's chief worries and concerns, their hopes and their ambitions, would be to listen to the content of their prayers and also the intensity with which they pray them. You know, we all pray about things that concern us and matter to us. You know, at the heart of them, that prayer expresses our desires. Therefore, there may be no better person to look at as a model for prayer than the Apostle Paul. You see, Paul records many spirit-inspired prayers throughout the 13 books that he wrote that are included in the New Testament. And in Ephesians, there are two prayers and one exhortation, one encouragement to pray. And in all three places, prayer and power are intimately connected. You know, last week we looked at Paul's first prayer, which is prayer to be full of knowledge in chapter one. The knowledge of our call from Jesus, the inheritance offered to us by faith in Jesus and the power which comes to us through faith in Jesus. So for this week, we're going to be thinking about the power that is in us and leads us to being worship centred in our prayers. And next week, following on from knowledge and worship flowing from God in our prayers. Then we're going to be looking at the power of prayer and the power of intercessions, the power of interceding and the power of spiritual warfare as a result of that knowledge and that worship. So in the second prayer of Paul in this letter to the Ephesians, he pours out his soul to God. He follows up his teaching with earnest prayer and by recording it, he helps us eavesdrop on him. That The Bishop of Durham, the Bishop Hanley Moore, back at the beginning of the 20th century, put it this way. Who has not read and reread the closing verses of the third chapter of the Ephesians with the feeling of one permitted to look through parted curtains into the holiest place of the Christian life. So let's now hear our reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians three fourteen to 21 For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Love and power. Power and love. Those are the greatest themes of perhaps two thirds of all the novels and all the plays and all the poems ever written. The love of power, when you stop and think about it, has laid waste to continents and empires. The power of love has driven weak people to do powerful things and not infrequently powerful people to do very foolish things. These are the forces which shape our lives, our homes, our culture, our countries, our politics and our world. These are the themes that run through the great prayer that Paul prays for the young Christians in Ephesus and through which we can learn so much and especially for our own prayer life. 
So as we come now just to have a quick look at, at his prayer, we come to the substance of it in verses 16 through to 19. And, and a great way to think about Paul's prayers are uh, like a staircase by which he climbs higher and higher in his hopes and aspirations for his readers and for us today. You see, his prayer sta staircase has four steps whose key words are strength, love, knowledge and fullness. More precisely, he prays first that they may be strengthened by the indwelling of Christ through his spirit. Secondly, that they may be rooted and established in love. Thirdly, that they may know Christ's love in all its dimensions, although it's beyond knowledge. And fourthly, that they may be filled right up to the very fullness of God. So let's now just take a moment to walk up those steps, to experience what Paul was talking about and to be challenged by his prayer for our prayers. So that first step is to be strengthened with power. He says, I pray that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Those petitions clearly belong together because they both refer to our inner being and also our heart. And then although one specifies the strength of the spirit and the other the indwelling of Christ, they refer to the same experience. For Paul never separates the second and third persons of the Trinity. To have Christ dwelling in us and to have the Spirit dwelling in us are the same thing. And some are puzzled by this first part when they remember that Paul is praying for Christians. Because surely they say Christ dwells by his Spirit within every believer. So how can Paul be asking this here? Isn't Christ already within them? That we need to say in response that, yeah, every Christian is indwelt by Christ and is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, as a 19th century theologian called Charles Hodges said, the indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees. So also is the inward strengthening of the Holy Spirit. You see, what Paul asks for his readers is that they may be fortified, that they may be braced, that they may be invigorated, that they may, as the Phillips paraphrase translation says, know the strength of the Spirit's inner reinforcements and may lay hold ever more firmly by faith of this divine strength, this divine indwelling. And this is confirmed when you look at the choice of word that Paul uses for dwelling of Christ in their hearts. He uses the strongest Greek word for dwelling available to him that meant to be settled down somewhere. It refers to a permanent as opposed to a temporary place to live and is used metaphorically for both the fullness of God abiding in Christ but also Christ abiding in the believer's heart here. Bishop Handley Maul, the Bishop of Durham, back in the early 20th century, draws out the implications of this when he says, the word selected is a word made expressly to denote residence as against lodging. The abode of a master within his own home as against the turning aside for a night of the wayfarer who will be gone tomorrow. And he goes on to say the residence always in the heart of its master and Lord who where he dwells must rule. Who enters not to cheer and to soothe alone but before all things he must reign. Paul prays to the Father that Christ by his Spirit will be allowed to settle down in their hearts and from his throne there control and strengthen them. Paul prayed that for his early church and that prayer is offered for us. Do you, could you, 
pray that prayer consistently for Christ to dwell increasingly strongly in your heart through your faith. Pray that he would be in your heart, in your mind, in your life, not as some sort of added optional extra, but as your master and your Lord. Could you pray that first step consistently for yourself? The second one is to be rooted and established in love. If we could ask Paul why he prayed that Christ would control and strengthen his readers, I think he would say that he wanted them to be strengthened to a holy love. For in the new and reconciled people which Christ is creating, holy love is to be the preeminent value and virtue. The new people that he is winning are God's family, whose members are brothers and sisters, who love their father and love each other, or should do. They need the power of the Spirit's strength and of Christ's indwelling to enable them to love each other, especially across deep social, racial and cultural divides which had previously separated them. To express how fundamental Paul longs for their love to be, he just brings together two metaphors, one botanical and the other architectural, both of which emphasise the depth as opposed to superficiality. These Christians are to be rooted and established or to have deep roots and firm foundations as Paul likens them to a well-rooted tree and then a well-built house. In both cases, the unseen cause of their stability and strength will be the same, will be love. That love is to be the soil in which their life is to be rooted, that love is to be the foundation on which their life is to be built. One might say that their love is to be both of a radical and a fundamental nature in their experience. For these English words refer to our roots and our foundations. So Paul prayed that for the early church. And that prayer is offered for us to use. So do you? Could you pray that prayer? consistently to be rooted and established in holy love, a holy love of God and for others. And pray that that holy love would be a deep soil in which your life is increasingly rooted. And pray that love is the foundation on which you build your life. Could you pray this consistently? For yourself. And the third is knowing Christ's love. We can see that Paul now moves from our love in which we're to be rooted and grounded to Christ's love which he prays that we might know. He acknowledges that we need strength and power for both. Strength to love and the power to grasp to comprehend Christ's love. Certainly the two can't be separated and it's partly by our attempts at loving that we learn the meaning of his perfect and good love. That Paul prays that we might have power to grasp the love of Christ in its full dimensions, in its breadth, in its length and height and depth. And Paul was not getting too carried away when he says that the love of Christ is wide enough to encompass all all of mankind, long enough to last for eternity, deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner and high enough to exalt him to heaven. When you look back at some of the biblical commentators, they express that it's finding a parallel to what we can go and read in Romans chapter 8, virtually saying where it says, wherever, whether you go forward or backward, up to the heights or down to the depths, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. 
ancient commentators went even further. They saw these dimensions illustrated in the cross. You see, for its upright pole reached down into the earth, but also pointed up to heaven, while its crossbars carried the arms of Jesus stretched out as if to invite and welcome the whole world. It may be a little bit poetic, but what it affirms about the love of Jesus Christ is true. We shall have power to comprehend these dimensions of Christ's love, Paul adds, only with all the saints. The isolated Christian can indeed know something of the love of Jesus, but his grasp of it is bound to be limited by his limited experience. It needs the whole people of God to understand the love of God, the Lord's holy people. You know, Jews and Gentiles, men and women, young and old, black and white, with all their varied backgrounds and experiences. Yet even then, although we may grasp its dimensions to some extent with our minds, we cannot know it in our experience. It's because it's too broad, it's long and deep and high, even for all the saints together to grasp. It surpasses knowledge. Paul has already used this surpassing word of God's power and grace, but now he uses it of his love. That Christ's love is unknowable as his riches are unsearchable. And perhaps we'll spend eternity exploring its inexhaustible riches and grace and love. But Paul prayed that for the early church. And this third prayer step is offered for us. Do you, could you pray that prayer consistently to increasingly grasp the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of Christ's love? Could you pray this consistently for yourself? And fourthly, that fourth step is to be filled up to God's fullness. Fullness is a characteristic word of Ephesians, uh, as well as the letter of the, to the Colossians. In the letter to the Colossians, Paul tells us not only that God's fullness dwells in Christ, that in Christ we ourselves have come to fullness. Then back here in the letter to the Ephesians, he makes it plain that we still have room for growth. As individuals, we're to go on being filled with the Spirit. And the church, although already the fullness of Christ, is still to grow up in him until it reaches fullness. He prays that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. God's fullness or perfection becomes the standard or the level up to which we pray to be filled. The aspiration is the same in principle as that implied by the commands to be holy as God is holy and to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. As such a prayer looks forward to our final state of perfection in heaven when together we enter the completeness of God's purpose for us and are fulfilled to capacity, filled up to that fullness of God which human beings are capable of receiving without ceasing to be human. But in saying that, Paul's last petition points to that heavenly perfection, that we have no liberty to try to evade its contemporary challenges for us. You see, for God expects us to be growing daily towards that final fullness, as we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit in Christ's image from one degree of glory to another. Paul prayed that for the early church. And this final prayer step is for us. Do you, could you, Pray that prayer consistently, to be filled by the fullness of God, to grow daily in that fullness, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit into Christ's image, one step after one step. Could you pray this 
consistently for yourself. So as we look back down that staircase, which we've been climbing with Paul, I'm sure we can't fail to be struck by the sheer audacity of it. He prays that his readers may be given the strength of the Spirit, the ruling presence of Christ, the rooting of their lives in love, the knowledge of Christ's love in all its dimensions, and the fullness of God himself. Those are big and bold petitions. But as climbers of this spiritual staircase, we may become short of breath and even a little bit giddy. But when we've prayed them for us and for others, when we combine it with the knowledge of God's power coming to us in his call, his offer of our inheritance, the power working towards us. And now this of God working in us of strengthening, of being rooted, of knowing, of filling to the point of overflowing. That one outcome of all of those prayer steps is that we can't help but be drawn into our worship. Through this prayer that we come to worship that all of God's glory and his glory is seen increasingly inside us. We receive this power as we worship as we adore God and we take him even more firmly into our hearts and our lives. And as the glory gets inside us, it changes and transforms us from the inside out through love. And finally, as we take each step in Paul's prayer, that he offered for the early church and which we can offer for ourselves, Could you pray those prayers consistently to be strengthened with power, to be established in love, to know Christ's love, to be filled with God's fullness and goodness? Could you pray this consistently for yourselves? Give them a go. Experience them and see the results. The overarching result of those prayers will be to give the God who saved you the glory. To worship the true God who wrapped himself in flesh and blood and came into our world and lived and died for our freedom. That you will worship him. And in those prayer steps that you will be filled with a sense of new possibilities as his grace works within you. That you'll be filled with excitement of new tasks and new callings as the Holy Spirit strengthens you and guides you. And you will be filled with new energy to accomplish your purpose and your calling for the glory of God. So now let's take that journey up those prayer steps with St. Paul now as we pray uh, and use what he wrote through the words that are translated in the message translation. Let's pray. For this we sit, we kneel or stand before you, our Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen us through his spirit in our inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And we pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge and that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So now to him who is able to do 
immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all the generations, for ever and ever. Amen. You are all things to you. Are-
as we bring our worship to a close once again. We just pray that you would grant us discernment that we might know what is best as we live to serve you and help us keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. Grant us love that we may abound in knowledge and in depth of insight and help us keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. And grant us direction that you will continue to be at the centre of our lives and help us fix our eyes on you, Jesus. And grant us joy and certain faith that we may be able to stand firm in the one spirit and help us fix our eyes on you, Jesus. And grant us that knowledge and that assurance of forgiveness that we might be pure and blameless until the day our Lord returns. And in that time, between that time, help us fix our eyes on you, Jesus. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Give a bit.